Uh, let's do let's do definitions in mysticism. Let's, let's I think go, it's important. Go. Yeah. I'll say uh, mysticism is the nagging suspicion that the apparent brokenness, discord, disunity, disharmony that assault any sensitive person every day in truth conceal a hidden unity. Hmm. The suspicion that, no, it's all one. It doesn't look like it's one, but I get a glimmer. I think it's all one. No, that's beautiful. Uh, I, <clears throat> my own definition, if I'm about to give one, would focus on that glimmer that you speak about. Uh, one gets a glimmer, you said. So I would speak of mysticism definitely as an experience. There has to be an experience, because otherwise, it's just talking about mysticism, but mysticism itself is an experience, and it's an experience of communion. That's where you say the unity of all. Mm -hmm. It's an experience of communion with the ultimate. My communion with the ultimate. Then so I got to have. Then we have to add one more thing. Mm -hmm. Then I think we have to say that because that could also be true for many other kinds of religious experience. I agree with what you're saying, but I, w I want to refine it more and say that that the communion not only involves the self within that larger communion, mm -hmm. but also at least a momentary dissolution of the self and its boundaries. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. that that would be the the one extra piece that we would have to add. I think that's an important piece to to add. That well, that's <clears throat> why the. Bible says no one can see God and live, and yet we can't live without seeing God. Uh, that's our life. Uh, that's fullness of life. Uh, so I tend to translate that passage, no one can live, see God and live. No one can see God and live happily ever after, as if nothing had happened. This mm -hmm. is the idea. It is a kind of dying. It is, a, as you say, an annihilation of the self in the ultimate, but that is our life. You see, when we lose ourselves, we find ourselves. Oh. <laughs> so could you just try to talk about a personal mystical experience so that people get an idea? I can only speak about the externals, you see. And um, for me, nature is often uh, very inducive to but uh, these mystic experiences that Maslow calls peak experiences. And they, he, do you know that he used to call them mystic experiences before he coined the term peak experience? I didn't know that. Yeah, and he coined the term peak experience only because mystic experience didn't sit so well in psychological literature. Uh, but he, God forbid. Right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so for the, to the end of his life, he insisted that... Uh, Mysti that the peak experience was indistinguishable from mystic experience. And, uh, and my, my peaks and my mystic experiences uh, come from uh, the environment, from, from nature very, very frequently. So uh, for, and for mountains, mountains, uh, I grew up in Austria in the mountains, so mountain climbing, for instance. Uh, and there are moments when I look at the ocean, let's say, and, and I listen to the music of the, of the, of the surf. Uh, as T.S. Eliot says, music hurts so deeply that it isn't hurt at all, but you are the music while the music lasts. So I become uh, the music of the surf, and, and I'm lost or lost in wonder. I think it was. Right. And uh, I completely agree with you, these big bang uh, uh, experiences. Uh, I think they are very rare, and the danger is that we are looking for them and waiting for them rather than uh, ac uh, um, accepting, as I so often have said, that the mystic is not a special kind of human being, but every human being is a special kind of mystic. And the difference <laughs> between us and the great mystics is that they allow this experience to flow into their everyday living. They live accordingly. 
because so what would that look like? That hmm? seems what very that looks important. Like. That's important. What does it look like to let to live your mystical according. experience? Yes. I think one can one can say that quite easily. Uh, one th one thing that everybody experiences in their mystical moments is this universal belonging. Yes. So you live as if you belong to everybody, and that's not only all human beings. Uh, so you you can no longer say we and they. <coughs> but also the animals and the plants, you, we are all one communion. That is a big topic. How do you get from spirituality, which, of which mysticism is sort of the core, Yes. most people feel more comfortable when you speak about spirituality, how do you get from spirituality to those, all those religions that you see around? And my answer is inevitably. Why, though? What, Why? what is it? Because uh, if you have this, an experience like that, you can't, you, you can't help it. Your intellect wants to explain it somehow. Right. And so your intellect swoops down on this experience and says, what was that? You see? And before you know it, even if it's just your private doctrine, you have a doctrine. Doctrine is <coughs> that is speaking about the ineffable. Uh, originally, more in poetic language, because only poetic language is, is strong enough to carry that weight. But you, uh, that would be myth. You see, you make mm, a myth, right. or then you interpret the myth, and so you get theology. So and did everybody start as mystics, and then religion rose? The yeah. religion starts from mysticism. There's yeah. no other way to start the religion. Yeah. But I compare this to a... a volcano that gushes forth is, is a, this big bang experience. And then the lava flows down or the magma flows down on the, on the sides of the mountain and cools off. And when it reaches the bottom, it's just rocks. You, you never guess that there was fire in it. So after a couple of hundred years or 2,000 years or more, uh, what was once alive is that rock. Doctrine becomes doctrinaire, uh, morals become moralistic, ritual becomes ritualistic. What do we do with it? We have to push through this crust and go to the fire that's within it.